So, dear class, this is the other uh, Beckett video I just promised you in the previous uh, video. And uh, it's, uh, I'll just read a couple of passages from it. It's called Company, uh, which sounds rather inviting. <laughs> We've got company. No, in fact, we probably haven't got company if it's a piece by Beckett. But uh, we, we have memory. And uh, company, whether there's somebody out there and who it is, uh, he hears a voice, um, uh, is, uh, is the issue in the piece. But it also contains some very uh, realistic and simple anecdotes for which uh, we're very grateful in the midst of the abstraction. Um, and I think uh, I would stress the strange beauty of Beckett's word music uh, the music uh, of language beautifully used is, is something that uh, I always stress. It appeals greatly to me. And beginning with Shakespeare in, in English, we have uh, a great uh, legacy of that which we've been given. But not everybody finds um, uh, music in words, even when they're beautifully strung together, unless there's some actual musical accompaniment. And uh, uh, that's like, I think, having uh, one sense less when it comes to literature than people for whom the sound of it uh, is uh, supremely lovable, and uh, which um, gives pride of place to certain writers, even if the content uh, isn't uh, so wonderful, if the form is beautiful, then at least you have something uh, to enjoy while you're being bored silly by the content. So company starts off with a sentence, a voice comes to one in the dark, imagine. So we're in the dark, which is slightly sinister, um, depending on uh, uh, how you interpret this darkness. And a, a few paragraphs later, he says, if the voice is not speaking to him, it must be speaking to another. So with what reason remains, he reasons to another of that other, or of him, or of another still, to another of that other, or of him, or of another still, to one on his back in the dark, in any case. Of one on his back in the dark, whether the same or another. So with what reason remains, he reasons and reasons ill. For were the voice speaking not to him, but to another, then it must be of that other he is speaking, and not of him, or of another still, since it speaks in the second person, were it not of him to whom it is speaking, speaking but of another, were it not of him to whom it is speaking, speaking but of another, it would not speak in the second person, but in the third. For example, he first saw the light on such and such a day, and now he is on his back in the dark. <laughs> it is clear, therefore, that if, he's not, if it is not to him the voice is speaking, but to another, it is not of him either, but of that other and none other to that other. So with what reason remains, he reasons ill. In order to be company, he must display a certain mental activity. But it need not be of a high order. Indeed, it might be argued that the lower, the better. Up to a point. The lower the order of mental activity, the better the company up to a point. And then he moves to um, leaps back in style and in time uh, to a memory. And he says, you first saw the light. And this could be because that's in the second person you did. It could be that this is the voice speaking to him, in which case maybe it's the storyteller's own voice speaking to him. You first saw the light in the room you most likely were conceived in. The big bow window looked west to the mountain, mainly west, uh, for being bow it looked also a little south and a little north, necessarily, a little south to Moor Mountain and a little north to foothill and plain. The midwife was none other than a Dr. Haddon or Haddon, straggling grey moustache and hunted look. It being a public holiday, your father left the house soon after the breakfast with a flask 
and a package of his favourite egg sandwiches for a tramp in the mountains. There was nothing unusual in this, but on that particular morning, his love of walking and wild scenery was not the only motive, but he, the only mover, but he was moved also to take himself off and out of the way by his aversion to the pains and general unpleasantness of labour and delivery. Hence, uh, the sandwiches, which he relished at noon, looking out to sea from the lee of a great rock on the first summit scaled. You may imagine his thoughts before and after as he strode through the gorse and heather. When he returned uh, at nightfall, uh, he learned to his dismay from the maid at the back door that labour was still in sw was was still in swing, despite. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm stumbling here because I need to enlarge the print. Um, uh, so the the maid has just told him labour is still going on, despite its having begun before he left the house, full ten hours earlier. He at once hastened to the coach house, some twenty yards distant, where he housed his De Dion Bouton, a famous motor car of the period. He shut the doors behind him and climbed into the driver's seat. You may imagine his thoughts as he sat there in the dark, not knowing what to think. Though footsore and weary, he was on the point of setting out anew across the fields in the young moonlight, when the maid came running to tell him it was over at last. Over. <laughs> That's not a question mark. Actually, Beckett writes, over, exclamation mark, with a certain, I think, irony. Um, it's, it's, it's done as if somebody was dead rather than alive. And in fact, the next paragraph jumps right forwards. And the, the voice, the speaking voice says, You are an old man plodding along a narrow country road. And you'll recognize that as being the recurrent locus of, uh, uh, of Beckett's uh, fictions and his imagination, an Irish country road. Uh, it doesn't say Irish, of course, and, and Beckett did a good deal of plodding along country roads when he was eluding the Nazis during Second World War, during, during World War II, and this was in France, and he walked uh, with his wife south uh, uh, down France, avoiding the SS convoys and avoiding the Nazis generally, steering out of everybody's way, using little back roads, um, which some uh, believe to have partly prompted waiting for Godot. There he was with a companion, a familiar companion, actually his wife, but still arguing to and fro, not necessarily agreeing and perhaps getting annoyed with each other, and people who certainly describe Didi and Gogo's relationship as a kind of a marriage. There he was with his wife, walking south along country roads. Um, so maybe that successfully um, blended in his mind to form one of those cocktails that I've described to you where uh, a great author's style is composed of potentially uh, incompatible elements which come together beautifully in his or her work. Um, the country roads of France blending with the country roads of Ireland and, and creating a location which for him is the location of man. Man is, human beings are, walking a lonely country road with, with, with somebody else um, or visible in the distance meeting somebody else as happens uh, very early on in Molloy. Um, or, or meeting again, as Didi and Gogo do after a night apart. Um, so this is where man is in, in Beckett's imagination. Compare Joyce, for whom man is all over the shop, doing uh, heroic deeds, banal deeds, but certainly very busy. Sorry, I'm touching my face again. Um, certainly very busy uh, with worldly activities, whereas Beckett has clearly decreed these to be kind of meaningless. Um, the existential moment uh, reaches Beckett, a moment of pure existence, um, reaches Beckett and his characters usually on the country road. So it's no great surprise to find yourself reading, you are an old man plodding along a narrow country road. 
You have been out since break of day, and now it is evening. Some sound in the silence, your footfalls, rather soul sounds, S-O-L-E, for they vary from one to the next. You listen to each one and add it in your mind to the growing sum of those that went before. You halt with bowed head on the verge of the ditch and convert into yards. On the basis now of two steps per yard, so many since dawn to add to yesterday's, to yesteryears, to yesteryears. And he, the first to yesteryears has uh, an apostrophe between the final R and the S. And the second one, to yesteryears, has an apostrophe after the final S. So you're adding them to yesterdays and to yesteryears and to yesteryearses. Days other than today, and so akin. <laughs> they're different days, but they're exactly the same. Uh, they grant, uh, sorry, the giant tot in miles. So he's totting them up in miles. In leagues, the lovely old word for uh, a large distance. <laughs> Seven league boots. How often round the earth already halted too at your elbow during these computations your father's shade in his old tramping rags finally on side by side from naught anew so so there at your elbow as you make these computations is the shade the shadow the ghost of your father your father's shade but it's a beautiful poetic term because it's also suddenly you're a little boy again and in the shade the shadow of your father um, in his old tramping rags and, and papa is now seen as wearing rags perhaps not literally rags but I guess the, uh, the clothes that he went walking through the gorse as he's described in that earlier passage when he's avoiding his wife's labour the gorse is a very thorny bush uh, the beautiful yellow uh, flowers or florets in the in the spring, but it's, you don't want to be walking through the gorse in good clothes. So perhaps father's tramping rags, uh, tramping clothes were, were virtually uh, rags. Uh, and then this wonderful final sentence: finally, on sorry, this is it's no punctu there's no punctuation, so it demands um, like a musician figuring out music without. Uh, bars or time signature exactly where the stress falls. Finally on, side by side, from naught anew. So um, that just about uh, uh, sums up this book, I think, and, and in many ways uh, Beckett's work generally. Finally on, like uh, on pig, as Potso cries so lucky, on, that's all of us, we're going on, that's you, <laughs> on with your midterm, <laughs> or if no midterm, on with your day, on, finally, on, side by side, side by side with a ghost, in this case, the shade of your father, and we are all accompanied by, by shades, um, as you'll find, I hope you're not, I don't have too many shades to accompany you, although you may already have those, but you certainly will find over a period of life that you're never alone. Uh, there are voices in your head that are not yours, as in this piece of Beckett's company. And that last phrase is, is pure Beckett, from naught anew. The music of it is, is to set against the bleakness of it, from nothing again anew. Every, every time we start from naught anew, and in French is a beautiful phrase, partir à zéro, which is, literally means to leave um, from nothing. Partir à zéro, from naught anew, is just the most beautiful phrase uh, into which you could translate that French phrase, even if this was written, I can't remember, uh, in English originally. Uh, partir à zéro is such a wonderful phrase in French. It means, you know, start again, start again with nothing. So, uh, dear class, it, my 15 minutes are up. <laughs> and I, I leave you to partir à zéro 
from naught anew, as we must uh, every day. And I look forward to my next communication, um, because when I, as I um, stare at my at my old face, <laughs> surrounded by all this white hair, uh, I feel uh, fondly in touch with you, even if uh, none of you are actually <laughs> watching. <laughs> In my in my imagine it's in the imagination like the opening sentence of company where a voice comes, Imagine. So I'm imagining that you're there and above all, I'm imagining and hoping that you're well and this finds you safe by my dear soul.